Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Olivia Jimenez, and I'm a Vortex company member, and I'm super excited to be... What is happening? <laughs> Do you have your Facebook on? Are you watching us on Facebook? Yes, I think so. Apparently, I cannot see the comments and be live on this at the same time. <gasps> Holy shit, this is terrifying. Technology, Isn't there like a 10 second lag? Technology, y'all. It's horrifying. I just figured it out. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I want to give a big thanks before I introduce the folks who are with me. Um, big, big shout out to uh, Melissa Vogt, who has been our tech guru at the Vortex, um, figuring out all of the things and making them happen seamlessly, even when um, the talent fucks it up. Um, <laughs> you're watching. Um, so I have uh, this evening um, a couple of my favorite people, uh, Carol and Yuko, who are um, fellow Rose Fellows with me. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the Enterprise Rose Fellowship later, I'm sure. Um, but what we really are here to talk about this evening is creative community development, which some of you may know as creative placemaking. Um, and really what is the role of artists uh, in these strange times and as we move towards whatever our new future is gonna be talking about resilience and art and all the things. Um, so will y'all introduce yourselves to start? Yes, no? No, um, no. <laughs> Je refuse. Um, so hi, I'm Carol Zhou. Um, I am a fellow in residence at Little Tokyo um, Community or Little Tokyo Service Center um, in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles, California. Hi, I'm Yuko Kabit. I'm a fellow at North Shore CDC based in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and my fellowship is here in Austin at Foundation Communities. Um, and just to give a little bit of an idea of what creative community development is, and Yuko and Carol, feel free to add to this. Um, but it's basically integrating the arts and community engagement into a design process. And that might be um, designing a building or a community plan, or it might be designing a program um, something in, in civic works, that sort of a thing is like a really broad overview of it. We could get into the nitty gritty. Y'all want to add anything just to that? Um, like maybe I would add that we are all embedded within community development corporations right now, um, which are known for having the resources and Jeez. the heft. Well, they vary across, um, yeah, different organizations, but they're known for um, building affordable housing and also for providing a variety of services um, to residents in affordable housing and um, to people in neighborhoods. But I also, when I think of artists in community development, I tend to think of artists in cross-sector work. Um, so I don't necessarily think of artists in CDCs or community development corporations, but I also think about like artists in transportation agencies, um, artists collaborating with health departments, with parks departments, etc. Yeah, I think that the uh, interdisciplinary nature of the work is um, super key to a lot of what I think all three of us have been doing, that being in those CDCs um, is an inherent part of the Rose Fellowship that we're working on. It's not necessarily where we all have started um our work but it's where we are together um and it really is i know for sure calling on me to work in that interdisciplinary way what about you yuko um yeah to echo both of you guys the interdisciplinary aspect of it was um something that i think yeah drew us all to this practice because i think as artists and creative we are sort of meant to ask questions in different fields other than the arts. And I think that's just sort of how we were taught in our field and how we sort of go about our processes. So it's a matter of like, you know, not like, you know, shoving, a, shoving an idea into a place, but sort of how do you kind of weave it together of things that are already in place. 
um, as far as systems go. So it's sort of a matter of, you know, you know, bringing relationships, like understanding the communities that we're working with, whether that's, you know, specifically with the CDCs we're working with right now, um, or with other interdisciplinary uh, areas, like how Carol was talking about, like transportation, like um, government, hospitals. So there's a lot of conversations that we have up around that. So I would be curious to know, um, for the two of you, what uh, sort of interdisciplinary work are you doing, if any, in addition to working with the CDC? Like, are you collaborating across any other sectors in addition to housing right now? Um, so I feel like I always have a couple of projects in the air, like I'm a consummate plate spinner. Um, I think artists are <laughs> no stranger to that mode of working. Um, so in addition to my planning work um, with Little Tokyo Service Center, I am also working on a public health project called Spa Embassy. Um, and it's about spa days for activists, but really reframing that way that we see like care work um, and trauma studies in community engaged work. Um, and then um, in my role as the Chief Ray of Sunshine with US Department of Arts and Culture, um, I'm also looking at how artists can be grassroots organizers in their communities, um, specifically when it comes to connecting to policy asks. I really like your title. What was Thank it again? You. It's the Chief Ray of Sunshine. Uh, we're animist up in here. Yeah. I hope you have business cards that say that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love business cards. You would have the best business cards. Um, aside from my work at um, North Shore CDC, I haven't, I guess right now, right now, it's mainly focused on North Shore CDC, but I know a little bit before um, well, actually a, a year before, but this kind of came up recently because of the pandemic was I contributed to a zine um, and it was about like Asian American, um, Pacific Islander American identity. And it was meant to highlight, um, well, it was like a call for artists and writers to talk about different significant foods in um, AAPI culture and it was called family style zine and it was just meant to be like sort of an educational zine filled with like art and writings about different foods and I wrote about wrote and illustrated about um, wasabi which is native to Japan um, and my mom's side of the family had grown their own wasabi for a while and had like their own small company and why I bring that up now is because recently them, um, the people who organized the zine, um, wanted to upload it for free for people. Um, so I can also paste that link in a chat that will go to people in the ether. Um, but yeah, so on that, there was also another zine that I contributed to last year, and they're also doing like a free download. Um, it's like either a free download or they're like um, raising money so then it can go to like different um, charities to help with the frontline healthcare workers. So that's like indirectly work um, that's a bit more kind of like policy or advocacy focused other than CDC work. Olivia, what about you? You don't have to just moderate this. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to give a shout out to you. Oh, you and did you illustrate that background that you have? Oh yes, this is my um, background of characters who are not social distancing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, so what I'm working on a lot is um, the intersection between art and health and community design. Um, so doing work around engaging folks in, in public health efforts and also um, working on messaging around right now, things like make sure you're washing your hands and wearing a mask and um, social distancing, unless you're a character in Yuko's background. Um, oh, thanks for sharing this link, Yuko. I'll share it in the Facebook chat and maybe Melissa can share it in the YouTube. Um, so I really am interested in this intersectionality um, of 
how art can help us to maintain our physical and mental health. Um, and I think some of those correlations can be kind of obvious. Um, for instance, something like dance seems like a really clear um, tie to maintaining physical health, um, but it might not be quite so clear how something like uh, drawing or um, painting or doing some sort of uh, visual art that you do just on a, a pad with paper or something like that um, contributes to physical health as well as mental health. And we might see more of a correlation there. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of really interesting movement in the times that we're in now around bringing artists into those modalities that are researching and creating protocols and um, all of these sorts of things. There have been some really interesting conversations uh, particularly around mental health, but also around changing the conversations on, on physical health. So that's really my big um, sort of interdisciplinary crossover, but I've also worked with um, places like parks departments and things like that, um, as Carol mentioned. Um, and I do wanna, uh, I wanna say on that note of me moderating, we're gonna be pretty loose form discussion today. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to put them in the comments on Facebook or on YouTube. And um, we, if we see them, we'll try to get to them. Um, so I, um, I want to know before we like dig a little more into the work. Um, so we obviously have seen some of Yuko's illustrations. I'm curious about what y'all are doing, like creatively just for you. Nothing. Or nothing. I love it. Tell us more. <laughs> I'm napping. Yes. Um, I am obsessed with the nap ministry. Um, and it's this woman who's just been creating all of this body of knowledge around um, our ideas of productivity um, and how for us, it's okay to take a break from grind culture. It's okay to take a break from hustle culture. Um, especially right now when those of us who have the privilege to stay at home might be feeling like really antsy. Um, so I think today, especially because I have had to go through like those conversations with myself about like, what is my output right now? Like, what is my worth as a human being? Um, and so today I actually found the nap ministry to be really, really validating. And I was like, right, like do nothing. Um, <laughs> I love the Nat Ministry. Um, if you're on Instagram, you need to be following the Nat Ministry because they have the best reminders that like, like you should take a nap, bitch. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you should also take a nap because literally your ancestors have been exploited by white supremacy. So, you know, it's not, it's not just a nap. And also <laughs> like you can do anything if you're not sleeping. You just, you can't. It's mm -hmm. not possible. Um, yeah. I've been recording my weird Corona dreams though. Um, I am really intrigued by that. Oh my God. I, I think my wackest one was um, like an, the, a member of the insane clown posse led me through like the Amazon. Um, like they had an Amazon lair and we like waded through the river on foot. Um, so I am also really curious in people's narratives of their Corona panic dreams right now. I actually had Ruth Bader Ginsburg was in my dream what? last night. It was awesome. I mean, I know she just came out of the hospital, but I don't remember really what happened. It was weird because the night before I I think I stabbed someone. It wasn't her. It was like someone who was like doing a crime, but it was really cool to see Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was just looking really serious. Wow. I remember and sitting in a chair. So, was but, she healthy? Yeah, she was very healthy. Yeah. She was like very like thinking very deeply about something. But those, those are, have been my Corona dreams. What about you, Olivia? Any? Um, I've had ones some of them have been really like hectic and weird and nothing makes sense where it's just like stuff on stuff on stuff and like I'm seeing Carol but really Carol is like my mom or what I, those kinds of dreams where it's just random people but they're different people mm -hmm. um but I've also had ones <laughs> where there's like a panic like something's on fire and everyone's running and I'm just sitting there like 
Why y'all running? <laughs> just do, do you Take feel like that reflects your current reality, Olivia? <laughs> an artist Stop in creative Stop community this. development. Just, just <laughs> things happen some days. Um, it's my uh, while I'm asleep version of napping, not needing to rush around while I'm asleep. <laughs> um, oh, the YouTubes gave us a question. YouTube? From uh, Preeti, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, question, how do we make sure artists are properly and equitably compensated when engaged in creative placemaking? Yes. Great also question. when engaged Great in question. anything, right? Great question. Yes. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Carol, I know you got feelings. Do you want to go? I have so many feelings. Well, something that I've been thinking about is like invisible labor um, and labor that is part of the process. Um, and so I think if we actually measured out, so, so I'm like literally if we measured out the number of hours that we spend in process and often in invisible process, such as making spreadsheets, calling people, um, hanging out with people and listening to their story so that they can trust you, you know, all of those hours add up. And I think one real challenge of advocating for equitable artistic compensation is when people only see the product and they go like, my kid could have done that. You know, like, why am I paying you this? So my kid could have done that. And then you have to explain to them that it's about a, like your hourly labor in the process, but it's also about your expertise. So it's about all the hours that you've put in prior to that as well. Yeah, I think that valuing of like the product or the project over the process is um, something that happens across sectors, um, particularly in, in this country, in this society. Um, and I think if we were able to put a value on process and more intangible things like relationship building and maintenance, um, then we would start to see a lot more compensation of artists in this sector. I also think that often um, when I see this work happening, artists are sort of the last tier of people to be brought in and paid and they get sort of whatever is left over um, to do the thing that is gonna be the most public facing rather than bringing artists in from the beginning, letting them be a part of the design process, compensating them equally with what you would compensate everyone else um, and letting some of that more invisible or emotional labor be shared by the group as opposed to shoving it all on the artist um, and then saying, we're gonna give you a stipend of $300 and that includes your supplies. Um, <laughs> which uh, I see things like that a lot. I just wanna be clear, a supplies stipend is not the same as a stipend for your work. I'm gonna say it again. A supply stipend is not the same as a stipend for your work, okay? All right. I'm just saying. Um, you, you go uh, tone us down on this. Cal calm us down. <laughs> oh, <laughs> calm us down. down. Tell, tell us we're being compensated oh. greatly. Oh. No, we're not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think another point I want to make, and I think you all can relate, is that you know exposure is not compensation like oh so i'll put it on social media i'll like share it with everyone but that does not that does not count as payment and i'm also a big advocate on artists contracts and what goes into those contracts and like how can we um you know sometimes you know those contracts are in legalese and how can we how can artists you know navigate the legalese of you know this line actually says that this person owns your work now or this organization owns your work now they can like do whatever they want with it so like how do you kind of negotiate those um conversations with people and how do you still like maintain relationships in that way so that's something I've been wary of and I've seen a lot um since you know going more professionally into art and I think that really gets to one of the, the hearts of this question, which is how do we make sure 
that artists are properly and equitably compensated. Um, and I think the first part really is like a conversation about what really is the work you're asking artists to do, right? And then because this is the way that things work here, you gotta have a contract um, because otherwise people are gonna do you dirty. <sighs> but um, do you all have any other methods that maybe you've seen work well or that you saw potential in but wish had worked better um, for, for getting what felt like fair or, or equitable compensation for you? Well, for me, it's like benchmarking against what's happening in other organizations. Um, and so I remember that a while ago, there was a spreadsheet going around about um, the salaries of museum employees. Um, and it was actually mind blowing how much people are not making in our sector, right? And so I always keep track of, you know, what are the terms of, you know, XYZ residency? Um, definitely what are, what are the terms of our fellowship? By the way, we get healthcare, which is dreamy um, and also unheard of. And I'm expecting to be on Obamacare after November, 2021, you know, but just like, I am always keeping track of best practices um so that i can bring those best practices to the table and say like hey xyz residency or xyz fellowship xyz organization is offering this um and this is what like can or should be a standard in the field and then i think just like being able to talk about compensation transparently with our peers um so that we can advocate our, for ourselves is huge and I think that goes across sectors, right? Yeah. Like, you don't have to be an artist to advocate for getting paid for your work. Let's be clear. Um, it's just, we have to do it more. <laughs> yes, and louder. And, yeah. We have um, to convince people art is real. Um, and we have to convince people art is valuable. It's a bit of a harder sell. Uh, mm. <laughs> Yuko, has there been any anything that you've seen that's really like impressed you or um, models that you've seen that work really well in terms of this compensation? Um, so I haven't worked for very long, so maybe I don't have a lot of examples yet, but I did remember something that's like maybe semi-related, but there is there's this designer um, he put together a link of all the paid internships in New York City, just so that was just a database for like people at school to go to be like, oh, maybe, you know, this company will actually pay you and like maybe give you health insurance too. Um, and, you know, his point is basically like there's a lot of internships, especially student internships that won't be paid. Um, so I thought that was just like a nice, you know, sort of a resource that he put together. I'm trying to look it up. I forgot what it was called. Um, but I had another thought that I think maybe going off of the thing I said before is I'm wondering if you guys also hear about, but I, I know in like freelancing, there's this feeling amongst artists that you have, you kind of have to set the bar as far as like how much you are compensated because then that becomes a benchmark of like how other mm -hmm. people will be compensated yeah. after you. So like yeah. if you go start at like organization A and they said like, oh, we paid this artist like this much because they said they were okay with that. And therefore we think that you will be paid that much too or like other sort of clients um, or people you um, collaborate with. It's sort of like, since there's no like union or anything, it's just kind of like, oh, this is just what I think is because this is the how much I paid before or I didn't pay them at all before. So I don't quite know how to pay you now sort of um, situation I've seen. Um, so we have two questions. I love that this is a really active chat. Do y'all want to take them or keep talking about money? Let's not talk about money because <laughs> we, we might come back to it. Um, I do want to make one note that something that um, my dear friend Rudy Ramirez says, um, shout out to you, Rudy, if you're if you're out there. 
um, on this note of what Yuka was talking about is that like, this is when gossip is a tool for good, right? And like chismeando and like talking about your bad experiences with like whatever entity is hiring, um, like that's a gift to your community, right? And like, if you had a really bad experience, um, someone refused to pay you or paid you less than they promised you or whatever happened, um, like don't let someone else fall into that trap, you know? Like do what your favorite internet troll would do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're gossiping about you. Yeah. You're on notice. <laughs> um like like tell people like sh the same way that that we all hope that people would share good opportunities and helpful knowledge like that feels positive like share the negatives because people need to know um yes okay let's look at some of these questions now maybe we can talk about something more fun than money um how are each of y'all collaborating with other artists during quarantine asks chris especially artists you never met IRL. Um, Chris is especially interested in remarks from multi multidisciplinary collaborations. Um, so I am actually a big fan of internet friends. Um, like I've had a lot of internet friends that I have not met IRL or that our friendships became online or I began online. Um, and so for me, well, right now I feel like we are thinking about what we can do in the digital space. Um, I think some of us are thinking about how do we overcome the digital space um, and create analog opportunities for people. Um, but I think for the most part, like we are collaborating in the digital space. And so for me, you know, it's like we're collaborating in the same medium that we're working with. Um, I am like neurotic Google Docs queen, neurotic Zoom user, j just like neurotic like digital collaboration tools, right? But something else that I've just been thinking about is um, Adrienne Marie Brown in Emergent Strategy says to like move at the speed of trust. Um, and that's also something that I've been repeating to myself, which is that it's actually okay to take the time to get to know other people, to dialogue, um, to go through a really long development process besides like, you know, before birthing something out into the world. Um, so I would say that's kind of my like abstract way of phrasing things. I don't have a concrete like, this is how I worked with a musician online. Um, or anything like, actually, no, I am, um, I know this amazing woman in the neighborhood. She invited me to a sound healing it, oh, on Zoom. It was amazing. Um, and so now I want to collaborate on like having her sound healing broadcast to other channels in the neighborhood. Yeah. Wait, I need to look at the question again. Um, as far as collaborating with other artists right now, um, maybe it kind of goes back to the zines I mentioned in the beginning. So those are sort of kind of yeah, non-IRL collaborations or contacts that I've been keeping. But I think as far as like non-artist collaborations, we're well, not quite, quite collaborations, but like as far as um, conversations that I've been joining into. So at North Shore CDC, I, um, along with two other of my colleagues, we've been doing small business outreach. And full disclosure, like none of us are really small business. That's not our background. None of us have like accounting background. None of us have like economic development background. So we're sort of going in as these volunteers who are calling up um, small businesses and being like, hey, we're from North Shore CDC. How are you? What's going on with your business? So we've been reaching out to like restaurants, beauty salons, nail salons, um, bodegas, you know, all of them, you know, varying degrees of open or not open. So been having a lot of conversations. So it's kind of like semi on the groundwork as far as learning what's happening with them and then been joining a lot of webinars learning about small businesses. So um, Massachusetts has this 
um, statewide coalition called MACDC. And I've been joining in on those calls. And I'd say like 50% of it is like economics talk. And I don't quite always know what they're saying, but you know, there's like conversations like, you know, advocacy work, like how do we reach like the smallest businesses? You know, there's language barriers. How are they supposed to fill out loans if they're all in English? So these are all issues that, you know, coming into the fellowship, you didn't, I didn't realize I would be like much more on this like um, statewide level kind of advocacy effort in this way. So I think that's really interesting. And me coming in as a sort of Trojan horse artist, not actually a small business person um, has been kind of interesting. So I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, yeah, how, you know, coming in as an artist, listening to these conversation and helping these small businesses, like how can, um, you know, we can support them in, ways like a lot of what we're doing of course is um immediate efforts and immediate relief so then sort of jumping in between think being a quote-unquote small business person but you know also an artist ish still um yeah i i've been hearing a lot recently particularly in this conversation around health and arts um about how um, artists and, and particularly like community engaged artists really can be these kind of bridge sitters and, and serve sort of as, as translators or interpreters or people who sit in those spaces in between like the business and the community or, um, you know, doctors or researchers and patients in these sorts of spaces. Um, and that for sure has been a way that I've been collaborating with other artists is sort of being a, a conduit and um, being a, a, a person who can kind of co connect them to a resource or um, we at Foundation Communities right now are doing a, a collaboration with some of our residents to do some public health messaging and I'm basically the, the in-between part, right? Uh, translating the artist's vision into the message and the message into the artist's vision. Um, and then of course, through the Vortex, I've had some really wonderful opportunities to collaborate with folks on like um, improv projects and readings and um, all sorts of things, dance. Um, there's, I really have been super impressed by the Austin community and our, our creative ways of getting online um, and, and doing all sorts of different performance um, and uh, being able to connect people again who maybe haven't met um, in real life before, which I think is, is really sweet. Um, oh, uh, Yuko, Felicia says you're doing an awesome job, Yuko. Your artist Felicia. perspective important role in how we assess and process how to serve people. Yes, Felicia. Oh, Felicia. Oh. Felicia, can we like <laughs> put that quote on Yuko's website? Is that cool? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent endorsement. Um, <laughs> Hi, Felicia. Sivone. Hey, Sivone. Um, Sivone wants to hear about our work in this time of physical distancing, um, which I think is a little different maybe than, than how we're working with other artists. Um, I know for me, I, a lot of the way that I work best, um, and a lot of the function that I've been serving, um, in my, in my work at, at Foundation Communities up until uh, we started physically distancing was very like on the ground like I needed to be in the room with people um, and it's been really uh, challenging but a, a very interesting shift to being remote and working from home um, and still trying to maintain some of those connections because a lot of them I felt like I had just started to build some of those relationships that Carol was talking about I was fairly new to the organization um, and, and trying to move at that speed of trust um, that had sort of just been built before all of us had the rug pulled out from under us. And so I've been spending a lot of time on the phone um, with, with folks, um, just being a human on the phone, <laughs> uh, which 
uh, is sort of like a throwback to like the 90s or the early 2000s for me. It's been a while since I just like talked to someone on the phone for for an extended period of time that wasn't my mom. Shout out to my mom if you're out there. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that and then doing a lot of this sort of um, organizing or, or translating role. Uh, there are other organizations that are arts-based organizations that have also lost their way of working or their community that they're used to working with um, and trying to plug them into our community who, um, because they live on our sites, um, we have pretty clear access to um, folks who, you know, might be feeling isolated or might be feeling um, really restless or cooped up or like they need something to do. Um, and so a lot of what has happened for me is I've shifted into more of a resourcing role than uh, sort of an on the ground engagement role. How about you too? Um, so I learned a few days ago that introverts only text two people a day. Um, and this was like really mind blowing to me. Um, I think my number of texts today is like 16 or something. Thank you, Rose Fellow Group Chat. Um, and so I've really been thinking about social isolation right now um, and social isolation as a like matter of life and death really um, in terms of are you going to be able to reach out to someone in an emergency? Are you going to be able to reach out to someone to buy you groceries if you're sick um, or if you're immunocompromised or can't go out? You know, just like I think this really highlights the need for social connection right now. Um, and so I've been thinking about the mandate of the arts as a way to like break through that social isolation um, and create connection amongst people. But once again, because we're in a moment where we actually cannot connect to a lot of people, like it is not wise for me to visit all 20 people that I'm texting, you know, that we're actually looking at like small scale, um, but like creating small scale, but also like deeply connected groups of people um, who can support each other. So that's one framework through which I've been thinking about my work and kind of thinking about because we have a lot of elderly in our community, um, thinking about, well, like what are the artistic measures that we can take to break through that isolation um, and make sure that people start getting to know their neighbors, which is also a way of like starting to get to know your local support system. Yeah, similarly in for my work with North Shore CEC to start, um, we've been sort of thinking of how to get over or get through this um, digital barrier that a lot of um, people are in our community face. You know, there's like an inequity balance. Um, you know, some people don't always have access to internet. Some people may not have an email, so you have to like reaching them, you really have to just call them. Um, from what I understand, like <clears throat> the resident calls that people have been doing at North Shore CDC, like, you know, some of them we haven't been able to reach yet or we've been able to reach people because, oh, we called this one person and they knew the other person that we couldn't reach. And same with small businesses, like, um, you know, my colleague, she's been reaching out to like the hair, like the hair salons, but the hair salons are like, oh, I know like, the two other businesses you've been trying to reach, I have their personal cell, so I can do that. So you're finding sort of these um, interconnected, you know, streams of communication that were already in place. And it's just a matter of like um, finding them and then you know, streaming the resources or like modes of messaging through um, these established um, communication courses. So, and also to highlight North Shore CDC, we um, then, or a small group has been putting together care packages. Um, Felicia has been helping with that. Hey, so Felicia. Felicia. Yeah. So I think in the care package, of, they would include um, some, I know that I designed some coloring pages. We would be donating some masks and gloves. Um, I think other like little goodie, goodies as well. So just like little gifts for people, I think. 
um, especially towards our um, single families and elderly population, I think it still was that we're targeting for the most part. Um, but yeah, it's like finding ways to sort of, you know, physically send people stuff now instead of just digitally or, you know, being able to go to them in person. So still kind of keeping a sense of warmth um, between ourselves and um, other people. And as far as personal work, yeah, I've been, even in personal work, I've been thinking of this digital divide that I think as far as my resources go, you know, I've been sending small letters to people, small cards, um, been doing like this small series um, online of people sending me photos of inside their house. And then I would send it back with like a little doodle or character on it. You're so it's so been interesting. Shout out your handle for that. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> I can do that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of thinking about that. It's been interesting, you know, people sending me this little snippets of their like home life. Like, oh, this is like a little steamer, like a dumpling steamer. Like, oh, this is a bread I just made. Or like, oh, this is my daughter Hunter hiding underneath a, um, a pile of blankets. So it's like kind of sweet to just see these little images. It's um, on Instagram, it's at home doodly, right? Home doody, yeah. D-O-O-D-L-E-Y? Uh, D-O-D-L-E-Y, yes. They're so cute, y'all, I love them. Um, I, that I, so this is a question like unrelated to creative community development, I guess we could relate it if we want to, but like, I, whatever, um, what's the best thing that you've gotten in the mail this quarantine season? You got, I actually have gotten an amazing thing in the mail. So I was at Santa Fe art Institute in February. Um, and I was in residency with an artist, Stacy Sibbs, um, who makes these modular garments that are held together with grommets. So they're like little triangle pieces that you just snap together um, however way you want. So like she, I want, so she was doing an art raffle, which I also thought was a really good way to um, make art accessible to people because I could never own one of her garments otherwise. But, you know, since I entered into the raffle, I like won this garment and literally you can snap it into like an evening gown, uh, you know, top and skirt set, a like bolero. Like a oh yeah, God, like you're not you know, wearing it every day. You wear it now. You're right, this is a failure on my part. Um, but basically also I have been jokingly talking with a friend about apocalypse wear. Um, and so I actually feel like this type of multi-way garment is also really great apocalypse wear. Um, yeah, so this is hands down best item that I've received in the mail and proof that like artists make your life better. Yes, can you give yes. a shout out again to that artist and maybe I can like- um, To Stacy Sibbs, yeah, let me find her website. I'll post it on Facebook. So you go, what's the best thing you got in the mail? Um, and in between two things, one of which you guys know of. <laughs> the first one is I, so I really like oatmeal. So I was looking on nuts.com. I think they specialize in nuts, but also other like dry grocery goods. And I found 25 pounds of oatmeal on it and I was tempted and then I bought it. And so I got a giant box of 25 pounds of oatmeal and it was like the best thing ever. So I just sort of, I didn't have a place to put it for a while. So I just had this giant bag and I was sort of dragging it across my kitchen floor, confused where to put it for a while. So then I just like shoved it into a plastic bin. And so I have that like normal um, Quaker Oats canister and I just like keep refilling in. I made like sheets of granola. So that was exciting. And then I want to say like the second thing, just because I'm staring right at it is like a little card from my boyfriend because it was just like, oh, I know things are hard and I miss you. And I'm just reading it again. Um, but things will get better and then we'll like go on adventures outside and then he drew like a penguin. So <laughs> it brings Aww. me joy to look at it. So between that and 25 pounds of oatmeal, so. <laughs> love or 25 pounds of oatmeal i mean aren't the they the same, same though yeah aren't they the same? The same. same um i have 
Um, gotten some really sweet postcards. So one of my quarantine hobbies. Um, I have always been a big fan of like sending actual letters and postcards and things like that. And it's like, I think it's a, a thing that like runs in my family. Like my dad sends me probably like 20 postcards a year. Um, but I have been painting um, postcards and sending them out and I've gotten some back. I got one today that was really beautiful. Shout out to my girl Paige who painted this, love it. Um, and then I also got um, from my, uh, she introduced herself to me as my work fairy godmother, which I think is accurate because what she sent me was really fancy, colorful pens and this book called The Book of Delights. And it was Aww. delightful. So shout out to Julie, so sweet. Um, love the mail. If anyone wants a postcard, tell me your address and I'll try to remember to send you one. No guarantees, because I have the Zoom brain. So. <laughs> Which I know is a real thing these days, um, which I, well, I know one of the things that we had been talking about leading up to this was uh, how much we all have the like Zoom fatigue um, and what are some of the interesting ways that we have seen or heard of to use Zoom. So I would love to hear this from anyone who is um, watching as well, any of the best uses you've seen. Of oh my God. Well, we but, also have a question, but also I just want to shout out my friend Camila Marquez. She had a Zoom birthday party that was like the best Zoom birthday party. Um, so basically she did a slideshow of herself, um, of pictures of her with people who attend, who were in attendance. Um, and she just narrated this slideshow and then she did um, Camila trivia. And it was, it was so good because we were all so engaged and we learned so much um, and it was all about her. So I definitely was like super inspired by the Zoom birthday innovations that have been happening. My other friend Yeji did a Zoom karaoke, which was, it worked. <laughs> you know, today I saw um, a coordinated dance orchestra performance by students at Juilliard. So I thought that was very impressive. And they had like guest stars like Yo-Yo Ma and John Baptiste from The Colbert Show. So it was really cool. You send us a link to that because that's on Oh the yes, I just saw it on Facebook, but I'll look it up. Um, yes, I've also seen some excellent Zoom dance parties. Um, I encountered a Zoom scavenger hunt uh, which I'm really into. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. And it took some coordination. It sounded like on, on the part of the organizer where it was like, they were cataloging if like, cause some people were on zoom and then there were people who would like just send text messages of like, I found this thing. Um, and there was like a whole spreadsheet to see what you had found, but it sounded really cool and really fun. And not all I want to do is a zoom scavenger hunt around my house. Um, where it was things like all these different things you had to find around your house and there were bonus points if you like doubled up uh, things in an image. Um, I'm probably not making it sound as fun as it was in real life, but it looked super dope. Um, also, the other day, uh, we discovered the whiteboard feature of <laughs> Zoom. I don't know if y'all know about this, but you can just be drawing doodles on Zoom, which I honestly, had one of the most productive feeling meetings of my life. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, so damn you, go it. Up, you go up to the top if someone has a whiteboard and you pick annotate and you get to just like draw things or point to them um, or whatever you want. And it really, it seems like so silly and like kind of, I don't know childish, but I legitimately had a very productive meeting <laughs> using this medium for um, like mind mapping and brainstorming. Um, and it was just fun, y'all. Um, oh, hi Seema. Seema sent us a message. Shout out to Seema. Um, can you talk about how you manage the relationships slash lack of relationships that your client slash development team has with community? 
especially if they haven't done a good job building trust. And especially if you're only brought in late in the game. Ooh, Seema, like a- you're asking us to call out our employers. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, they might be watching. Can I just say that I love Seema because Seema is like not afraid ever to just like go for it. Just like call out the hard questions. Um, how you manage relationships with the lack thereof with the community especially if there's not trust or if you're brought in late in the game, which I feel like a lot of that tends to go hand in hand, right? If there's not trust in the community, then you're probably gonna be there too late to build that trust. Um, well, a couple things. So one is, I feel like, one is I really love working the outsider role. I really love working the artist role and I feel like I just like spilled my secret and so now that's not actually gonna like work for me anymore you know but I love being like oh my god this is an art project oh my god I just got here I don't know anything right um I actually think that um the outsider role um can work to your favor at the same time um that it can be a limiting role Um, Something else that I've realized, which is something that I also am constantly learning, is that when I work with organizations, it's not just about organizing like in the community, it's also about organizing in your workplace. Um, And so I need to keep in mind that actually like that's part of like my invisible hours that I need to do, right, Um, is doing that work navigating my workplace, but also kind of saying like, okay, this is as much as I can do. Um, And being very transparent about like where I stand within the decision-making processes in my workplace. Because I feel like when I do community engagement work, as long as I'm transparent, then people can kind of separate like their relationship with me um, and their expectations of me from like their relationship with the organizations that I work with. you know, for better or worse. I think that's super true. And for me, transparency is a huge part of that process, especially um, if I'm brought in late in the game or if there's not a lot of trust to be able. (laughs) Seema says it doesn't have to be your current employers. Just our past employers. Thanks for (laughs) noting. (laughs) But I would say across the board, um, if it's late in the game or if if there hasn't been a lot of trust, especially then I find transparency really important um, for setting expectations across the board um, and just being able to say like, I don't know, or I don't have a good answer for that right now, but I can work on it has been an incredibly powerful practice for me in this work. Um, because it, it, it's really, it's a leveler, right? If none of us know, then like we're all on the same page. Um, and it really is about sharing power. Like, I don't know, but someone else does. And, and I'm open to that being, you know, well, maybe, you, maybe you know, as the person who asked me the question. Um, and it can also help to illuminate some of the things that maybe none of us know, or no one has really been thinking about in a concrete way that like, really need to get answered before something can move ahead. Um, I, like Carol, also really love to be in this role of uh, like the outsider. And I personally really revel in like not knowing any of the answers. It's because like, I really love to be like, I have no idea. I don't know, (laughs) like, um, because for me that gives other people the opportunity to come up with something as well. Um, I think sometimes there's a, if we both acknowledge like we don't know what the answer is, then we have a lot more freedom to brainstorm something that might be the answer, but like might not be. And it doesn't really matter because we don't know. Um, so we, we can explore more possibilities moving in that way. Um, I also find that often in processes where um, 
I'm brought in at the last minute or there's not a lot of trust, transparency hasn't been part of the process up until then. Um, and so that can really help to build trust really quickly um, is my experience. So I don't think that's true all the time, but that's been my experience for the most part. Yeah, I think for me, um, yeah, basically all of that as far as, you know, coming in as this outsider person and also acknowledging like, you know, there are things that I can bring as far as like expertise, but then there's at a certain point, like I need a certain other expertise, whether that's like the community voice or whether that's, you know, someone who knows the history of the neighborhood more than I do because they've studied it for 20 plus years and I'm only only 25 so that obviously um so I think being humble about that and being transparent as far as like this is what I don't know and I identify the experts in the room who will know and therefore I want to work with them so um you know adding yeah, I think yeah there's like those invisible hours that you were talking about, Carol, of like, you know, identifying people in your organization that you want to collaborate with as far as like, oh, I know like so-and-so, like she is always like on the grounds, always speaking with the community members. Like I definitely want her like on this project I'm working on or at least this conversation I'm having because I know she has the expertise of the community board voice and even broader than that, it's like, I want to talk with these um, elementary school teachers because, you know, or, you know, even the students, um, because, you know, the students are sort of like, you know, the newest generation into the neighborhood or they're growing up in the neighborhood and how are these teachers seeing these students grow up? So you sort of like find yourself asking the questions and then seeing like, okay, then who is the person to answer these questions? Um, and I think also to the outsider role, like it is, you know, comforting to, well, I don't know, I mean comforting, it's not the right word, but you know, there's, it's nice when you can kind of be like, I don't know. and Therefore, someone else is the expert here, but I know, I think all throughout life, you can find yourself in a position of when people know you're the new one or the outsider, sometimes when you ask a question, it can kind of be met with like either hostility or people saying like, no, that question is not appropriate here. So I know I've seen that in like many different cases across the board. Um, and I think that in previous work and other experiences, yeah, transparency, you know, works very well in different, you know, across sectors. So, you know, when you reach out to a client or like an audience or community, you're saying exactly, you know, what your intentions are and there's like a bit of vulnerability to you as far as like, you know, I'm coming in as a person who, you know, from X, Y, Z, and I recognize that like I'm X, Y, Z, um, but I really just want, you know, to make sure that we can be on a level to talk with each other and that way we can get to know each other and then we can work towards a common goal or a common interest and you kind of be able to work with them in that process, so. And I think that, particular approach is really um, crucial to if you're dealing with um, populations that are going through trauma or grief, which like literally everyone in the world is right now. So um, just keeping that sort of awareness of self and of like context in, in mind. Um, and then a little bit on the flip side of that, um, I think that there can sometimes be um, some power in just attributing the best aspects of whatever the work is to the people who you're working with. So like uh, assuming that best practices, like Carol was talking about earlier, just assuming that those best practices are in place. Oh, well, okay. So of course we're doing this. So, and then when they go, what are you talking, what, uh, what do you mean? Oh, 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 like, no, let me like, you know what I mean? Just assuming that everyone is doing the best possible version of their work um, rather than telling them that they're not. Um, mm -hmm. It can be really powerful um, or a really interesting way to start to uncover part of what's not working because sometimes it's not that 
they're not doing that thing. It's that they tried to do it and it didn't work because X, Y, Z. And so when you tell them, well, you should be doing this, it can feel really like an attack um, because they tried to do that and it didn't work because X, Y, Z. The other thing that I really like to do is strategically invite um, too many people into the conversation, um, which is to say when working maybe with folks who want to work with or for a community, but you look at their meeting structure and the community isn't really represented in those decision-making meetings. In any meeting that you're holding, just being really, um, again, sort of like obvious about inviting those people and like assuming that that's just how things go, um, because why wouldn't it? Um, and more often than not, I've had really good success with that because then later down the line, there'll be these concerns of like, oh, well, we really should talk to so-and-so about whatever this mm. thing is. And I go, oh yeah, they've been in the process since the very first meeting, they're on board. Um, and it saves work down the line and, and then it starts to become, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so transparency, but also this role of the- But outside. also trickery. <laughs> But it's not really true, though. You know what I mean? It's but also like, openness. Yeah. It's like it's like strategic naivety, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. No, um, I, it's it's assuming the best in people is how we'll po we'll put it politely. Assuming oh my God, Olivia, that I feel like I do a kind of a variation on that, which is inception. So yeah, I'm actually always trying to practice inception where I'm all, I'm never trying to make sure that the idea comes from me. I'm always like, well, you know, someone, someone said, someone, someone had a great idea. Let, let, let's bring them. I, I want to hear their great idea, but it's all like, if I have done my inception, right, it is all what I want. <laughs> sharing your secrets <laughs> I know I know I should not share my secrets I hope no one watches this um <laughs> right now. Ooh, get off the chat get off the chat um there was a question farther up from Amelia Turner which I I thought was a really great question yeah um, I'm sorry Amelia I love you which is are there future plans in the works for a creative community rebuilding and healing post COVID-19? Yes, this is a great question. These are awesome questions. I'm like, I you guys get our secret. I'm the audience right now. Y'all yeah. <laughs> are really coming with this. Um, our outline was like literally three bullet points. So I'm really impressed with y'all right now. Transparency, right? Um, <laughs> Oof. Can you read that question again? That was that was very nicely put. No. Um, are there future plans in the works for creative community rebuilding and healing post COVID-19, whenever that may be? I think the silence speaks volumes right now. Um, I mean, I think in terms of what I have seen, um, there are, I haven't seen very many sort of concrete um, plans or developments in the work, maybe, or in the works rather, maybe you all have seen something different. What I have seen is a lot of conversation, a lot of process happening around it. Um, again, particularly in that health and healing world, talking about how we're all right now globally going through a collective moment of trauma and grief. And um, so how do we as a community find creative solutions to coping with that, right? Um, because we can't rely on the, the same methods that we always have because this has impact across the board there's there's no one that's not affected by this right now um so i mean i feel like the short answer on my end is kind of um 
I'm hearing some really exciting conversations, but um, frankly, being in Texas where there's such a push to go back to how things were from some folks, um, to me, it can feel a little disheartening um, at times to see how quickly folks want to return to a system that was clearly broken and frankly, like clearly not for a lot of them. Um, but they're, they're so attached to it, right? Um, that, that it's hard to let that go. And so um, a lot of what is giving me hope right now in the conversation is around how can we start to transform that system or start to let go of those parts of the system that we got really used to and that we thought we liked, but actually it turns out weren't that good for us um, and grieve them and then start to do meaning making. And that's a lot of the conversation mm. that I've seen right now amongst um, the arts community and also in the, the sort of health and healing community is around meaning making um, as it relates to this sort of global grief and trauma. Um, yeah, I was on a call earlier this week where um, someone said, we are on month two. Like we are on month two, even though it's felt like 10 years. Um, and I also, um, like I grew up in Texas. I was in Texas when Katrina happened. And then when I was living in Dallas um, a few years back, I actually lived next door um, to someone who had been displaced from New Orleans due to Hurricane Katrina. Um, and so that for me just brings home like how long the after effects of this ripple through our community. Um, and so something that I really have been thinking about is like, how do we prepare for this to be a long process, right? Like how do we prepare ourselves like physically, mentally, emotionally, um, but also like our, our governments, our, our institutions really prepared for this long recovery process? Because like you said, Olivia, there's so many calls to open up the economy and go back to normal as if we just like kicked this in two months. Um, and that's just not something that we know is gonna happen from experience. Um, and so for me, like thinking about this in the context of community work, it's like, how do we create the advocacy conditions, um, you know, for policy that does give us the space to breathe um, while also like practicing that space to breathe on the ground. Can you talk a little bit more about that, that idea of, of having space to breathe in this work? Because I think from my experience, that's really a challenge um, in advocacy work and in arts work. And especially when you're combining the two, um, one of my like personal nemeses and professional nemeses is burnout, at, which mm -hmm. is rampant yeah. in both of those fields. So yeah. I would love to hear a little bit more about that from you. Um, I mean, for me, it's literally reading a lot of pop psychology um, and coming up with like concrete care practices for myself, um, which to be honest, like I wasn't practicing a few years ago um, and burned out pretty quickly on that. But I think it's like creating a culture of napping, um, you know, of slowing the freak down, right? Of moving at the speed of trust. And I mean, this is, for me, this is a culture shift. Like when I think about culture workers, I don't just think about like, boom, like the art that we're producing. I think about like the processes that we're living. Um, and so I do think that like we as culture makers and meaning makers, like you said, Olivia, have a big role in saying like the world is globally traumatized right now. Um, and you know, the least we can do is slow down. And by the way, there are a lot of pop psychology books that back this up, you know? Yeah, I think um, I've also, <clears throat> I remember pretty early on, I think somewhere on Instagram even, there's sort of this like arts and advocacy handle that I follow but early on, like maybe even like a month ago, they really kind of set the mode straight of saying like, you know, like uh, advocacy is already 
it take it does always take a lot out of you as it is and with like a national pandemic on top of that like you know the call was essentially like you know obviously the issues that were important before are still relevant now like climate change um you know domestic violence abortion but you know in the normal days before the pandemic like you know you were you are always fighting for it you know it's important to still fight, but you know, don't kill yourself fighting for it. Don't burn yourself out fighting for it because this is an unprecedented time. Um, you need to take care of yourself too, while also trying to fight for the world. Um, and I think back to the original question of kind of creative future plans um, to relate to Carol on your on the realization that it's been two months or months to, I know in like a previous all staff call with North Shore CDC, um, our CEO was saying like, you know, before we were thinking maybe we would, we would be in this for like two weeks, maybe three weeks, but in that call, like a couple of weeks ago, he was like, you know, we really have to think about doing this for the long haul guys. Um, and so we need to think about the processes more. We need to think about, you know, what, will be doing like this for an extended period of time. So I think that was very jarring, but you know, everyone on the call was like, no, you kind of needed, we needed to hear that and needed to be like, okay, let's just start and hit the ground running. Um, but yeah, I think um, as far as things that I've seen as, you know, in future post COVID or post quarantine or sort of post reopening, I know on the Massachusetts CDC calls that I've been on, they've been talking about how Governor Baker is putting together a task force to think about processes of reopening. So there's like a section of like, you know, how will small businesses open? Like, will they need a requirement of like a certain amount of PPE or like they need like plexiglass shields to separate themselves from customers at restaurants or more convenience stores even. Um, and I think that's, that conversation made me think a lot about like, you know, space usage. Mm. So I remember yeah. there's either like um, a state in the United States or New Zealand because New Zealand's smart. Um, they were redesigning their roads to be like a little bit wider, redesigning them. So there was more space for like pedestrians to walk and socially distance or like for bike lanes. Um, so it's like an interesting way of how you're using space to kind of be in the sort of pandemic world um, and kind of trying to look for that article or that section. I came across this other article called how redesigning the patient journey will save lives during COVID-19 and beyond. So there in the article, I was just skimming was saying like, you know, how will patients, you know, what's the waiting room going to be designed? Like what is like how long are you going to be in the waiting room for? Like how are you kind of thinking about the flow of patients into and out of the hospital? Um, so and it's like, you know, while, while they're waiting, like what are they doing? Like how can you reduce your anxiety? So I thought, you know, those are considerations that, you know, artists can also definitely be in that conversation about. Yes, I am sharing a couple of links right now in the Facebook that maybe Melissa can share to the YouTube um, for the Arts and Medicine Project, which is um, exactly what you guys talking about, um, of thinking about these, these ideas of medicine and how can we, um, I don't always love the term design thinking, but use design thinking or arts thinking to improve our medical system, which um, I think very few people would disagree with me uh, if I say that the medical system that we have in this country is super broken. Um, but this is in fact something that is, is part of a worldwide collaboration, um, this arts and medicine projects list. Um, and it's, it's a growing field of really bringing artists in and, and acknowledging, I, I was able to attend um, online a great virtual uh, conference this week um, VICH, VICA, but it was, it was arts and health. Um, and there was all of this great conversation around why artists of various disciplines make incredible researchers. 
Um, and this is something that we had talked about, the three of us, um, a little bit earlier this week as we were talking about um, doing this panel of, of artists really bringing very tangible, very important skill sets to the workforce and to the problems that are at hand right now. So I think um, a lot of us as artists might be really interested in things like research and feel like maybe we're not qualified because we don't have the right degree or we don't have the right background. Um, and the medical community increasingly is really acknowledging that artists know how to ask questions, they know how to listen, they know how to think outside the box, they know how to come up with creative solutions, they know how to engage um, communities and patients and, and um, these sorts of things in, in ways that traditional research and traditional medicine hasn't. Um, I also shared in the chat um, the Atlantic Fellows um, site from the Global Brain Health Institute. This was something I learned about specifically through that conference. It's a year long paid, paid, uh, yes. Um, Does it have it, health insurance though? Uh, that would be highly uh, ironic. It might be because you're partnered with a university, so I bet. Ooh. Um, and one of the sites is in Ireland, so yes there. Uh, <laughs> yes, because some countries have it better than us when it comes to healthcare. Um, a year-long paid fellowship and they look for folks from all disciplines. So again, coming back to this interdisciplinary work and they specifically state they're interested in working with artists and with creatives to build into the research on global brain health, which is a huge field, right? It can encompass physical, physiological, neurological conditions, but it also is things like mental health and, um, you know, depression, anxiety, these sorts of, of processes that we're all going through right now. And then I think a lot of us are finding that art and creative practice is helping us to cope with that. Um, and so to come back to Amelia's original question, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I haven't seen a lot of concrete community plans, but I see a lot of really promising process conversations um, and on a more um, sort of micro level, I know in my organization, I've seen a lot of work towards shifting a focus and in both conversation and in, in programming options to focus on mental health, not just for um, maybe as nonprofits, the communities that we are in service of, but also for our staff um, and making sure that everyone is cared for. Um, and also shifting these conversations to, um, you know, focus on, on thinking a little bit outside of the box and, and being willing to take some risks. Um, especially as we adapt more and more things to online. And that really is shifting the conversation even more towards talking about accessibility and inclusion and, um, you know, why some folks are excluded, whether it's, you know, by their own choice or is it because they don't have the technology they need? Is it because we only provide programming in certain languages? Is it, you know, what are, what are all of the reasons for this and how can we work around that? So um, I think it's going to be a journey, but... As Carol yeah. said, this is only month two. But I also feel like maybe this is our moment to like speak what we wish like a process that engaged healing um, and that engaged recovery looks like because I have seen, okay, this is like one of my pet peeves. I've seen people go, oh yeah, we care about mental health during this time. And you click on their resource page and it's like a link to the suicide hotline, you know? And you're just like, that That feels like you do not care about mental health um, in this time actually. So in terms of like our conversations about trauma in public health, I actually think we have a long way to go um, before we understand how to like integrate it into our processes. So that, because for me, I'm like, that means therapy for all, you know? I, I'm like, that means we like get a core of therapists, like we pay their salaries, we get therapy for all, right? And Not they get that therapy way. too. Yes. Because no, who is therapizing yeah. the therapist yes. right now? I that know is therapizing true. isn't a word, but like whatever, let it be. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
you know, but it's like, that's not, you know, like that's not part of a like rinky dink resource page that tells you to call a hotline, right? Pet peeve. Have seen that in this pandemic, pet peeve. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so to shift um, to maybe like a slightly more positive, um, what is the sort of most promising or your favorite or the one that makes you the happiest, like um, mental health supportive process or program or whatever that you've seen? What's the thing that's keeping your, your mind right right now or that you love that's keeping other people's minds right? Um, honestly, meme accounts. Um, oh, yes. Uh, right? No, meme accounts are, I really believe in laughter as like a somatic release, right? Like when you laugh, you feel better. Maybe because you are better. Um, yeah. Um, Sidebar, um, your body um, and therefore your brain can't tell the difference between artificial and genuine laughter. Like they're the same. <laughs> so it's the same with smiling, right? Or those exercises where like, if you stand up with your chin lifted high, like you feel more confident. And if you like scrunch down, you feel sad mm -hmm. or whatever, same sort of thing. So even if you were just like fake laughing or fake smiling, instant boost. So we need to have like fake smiling Zoom sessions every morning is what you're saying for global health. We're all just going to laugh I like this. I did just lead um, <laughs> some laughter yoga for my colleagues. Ooh. Yeah. A good time. I enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> okay. So my answer is memes. <laughs> I also believe in the power of comedy. I've been, before I was watching a lot of John Oliver and I was doing that before, but since pandemic, I've also tuned into like Colbert and like Seth Meyers. And I think, you know, they're still talking about the news, but they're you know, kind of distilling it down and sort of, I don't want to say making light, but they're making it a little bit more, you know, palatable. Um, compared to if you were to try to sit through those presidential task force meetings. Um, so I would much prefer hearing it from them rather than through the original source, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, memes are great. And I think it shows like the way that humanity is responding in just trying to make things, you know, feel like, you know, we're still human, whether that's like, oh, um, we made a fake restaurant inside of our living room for our boys, or let's um, go like five of us in our different cars and say good morning or happy birthday to a nurse going into work, or let's all like, um, you know, dance on top of our cars in like this empty parking lot. <laughs> and it's like, oh, this is, this is very sweet. So there are a lot of meme accounts that I'm following. Uh, and also otherwise, there's, I know a few weekends of friends and I, we've been using like Netflix party to watch movies at the same time. So it's like a Chrome extension, you download it and um, you, if you have Netflix, then you click on the icon and you can like watch movies at the same time. So you can avoid that awkward, like let's press the button at the same time and make sure we're watching it at the same time. And there's a chat function. And then I've been using like Discord a lot um, to play online games with friends a few weekends. So that's been fun. So you can kind of like, you know, play a drawing game or play like a kind of apples to apples, cards of humanity type of game. So I think keeping in touch has been getting me through sending photos to people, people sending photos to me back. So those have been nice. I've been having Zoom arts and crafts parties, mm. which is super fun, um, where it's literally just like whatever, like sometimes someone is like baking or like painting a piece of furniture or um, whatever, like, you know, actually like drawing something by hand or um, the other day I did a jewelry making one, which is like very much not my forte, but I am working really hard <laughs> on a pair of earrings. Um, and I think having those spaces just to 
play like y'all are talking about and have some levity when everything is so heavy right now is super important. I mean, all the time. Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer and proponent um, of the power of play just in general. Um, and I think most people who know me can attest to that. Um, I'm not a, like a super big fan of taking anything too seriously, um, even if we can acknowledge that it's very serious. Um, so yeah, I think for me, finding those ways to like be playful and um, not let things be so heavy or, or so serious, you know, um, whatever, whatever that is for you, you know, um, if it's I don't know, wearing like a silly hat to your Zoom meeting or whatever. Um, I think that can really add a lot. Um, and I think don't be afraid to be the person that suggests it because I am pretty sure all of us want that right now, honestly. I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. <laughs> Actually, like, I want- yeah. Oh, sorry. Um- no, when you were saying that, I reminded me of this illustrator that I follow on Instagram. I might be pronouncing her name wrong, Gemma Corell. And she just does these like daily-ish comics of like, like isolation memes. So she's like, oh, at-home date ideas for self-isolating couples. Like enjoy a lovely waterside picnic. And it's just these two roommates eating a hot dog by a sink or like, featuring your neighbor's leaf blower and assorted banging noises. And it's like, visit a museum. And there's these two guys just looking inside of their drawer and being like, whoa, it's my Blockbuster card or my Nokia from 2002. (laughs) So I think like, yeah, you are just kind of um, documenting like this time in like a humorous way or like a introspective way has also been very interesting for me to see. So um, I know the New York Times have been doing the sort of art in isolation series where they're asking different illustrators to contribute, like, you know, what are you seeing outside of your window? Or like people submit comics about like, how are they feeling in isolation? Um, So some of them range from like humorous to more like introspective to solemn. So that's been really, um, I think it's very important for as artists to be like, you know, responders to the situation. We're also being asked to document the situation um, and thinking about like, you know, the emotional state of everybody. I personally really love that phrase of arts responders and this idea of artists as responders, Um, especially in the context that we're in now where we're talking so much about first responders, which is not necessarily Um, Mm. to correlate artists directly with frontline workers who are now especially but have always been like saints right like acknowledge that these are people that are sent from like whatever deity or whatever like that you might they these are the like finest people on the planet well let's not get it twisted Um, But this idea that artists as responders it's not like a passive term. I think that often we think of response as something passive, like something comes at you and then you respond. But when we think about this term of first responders, it's a very active term. Um, And I think that many artists can relate more to that sense of urgency and of action than the sort of like passive, the more passive nature of that word, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I don't know that I have like a concrete thought on that. I just really am liking that term and I've heard it a lot lately. So I just wanted to uplift that a little bit. Um, Cool. Well, Olivia, I have a pizza date in 10 minutes. Um, Pizza date, love it. But thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you so much for joining and you too, Yuko. And thank you so much to Melissa, our tech wizard and to the Vortex. Um, if you're able to donate anything to the Vortex, you can go to vortexrep.org donate. Um, 
You can also take a look at our organizations if you want to donate to organizations that are doing work directly in the community. Um, it's foundation communities here in Austin, um, in Los Angeles. There's Carol. It's Little Tokyo Service Center. Um, yeah, in LA. And in Salem, Massachusetts, it's North Shore Community Development Co Coalition. Also, we North have Shore personal Sense. Venmos. That's where um, I was going. No, <laughs> no I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You can also get out of some Venmo. Um, go for it, Carol, since you were ready. No, I'm like first name, hyphen, last name, but also um, I want to shout out um, artist relief funds um, and mutual aid funds that people have been working on. Um, you know, because like we're salaried right now. Um, so I've been redistributing um, like the, my stimulus check. Um, so mm -hmm. there's the Dallas Artist Relief Fund. Um, there's probably a relief fund in your own community. Um, there are relief funds for undocumented folks. Um, I know in Dex Texas, it's Workers Defense Project. Um, and then there are also bail funds um, for people who are incarcerated. And then Venmo us. <laughs> you go anything from you? Um, yeah, no, I mean, all of that. Um, so North Shore CDC, we like, you know, there was just um, Giving Tuesday, which is like the global call for like, um, from nonprofits to for Know, to allocate like donations. So North Shore CDC has been doing a lot of on the grounds work as well as other, um, you know, CDCs probably in your local area, other food pantries, um, mutual aid funds. So if you are able like, you know, please donate or um, help in some capacity for them. And um, yeah. Melissa says, throw your Venmos up in the, the chat on Facebook. Um, mine is up there. Um, I also encourage you if there are local artists in your community who you love, who you've always wanted a piece from, like reach out to them, um, support their work. Um, same with any of your immigrant communities, um, especially undocumented folks. Like it's a really fucking challenging time right now, especially if you're not receiving a a stimulus check that is um, of differing amounts of value depending on where you live. It may or may not even cover one month's rent, right? Um, redistribute that money if you can. Um, that's what I, I've been doing as well because again, we are lucky enough to be salaried and employed right now. So I've been redistributing to, to local organizations. And if there are organizations that you love that you maybe can't contribute to, but you wish other people would, share that. Um, because you never know who's going to see it and who's going to have a little bit extra to get. Um, so we have uh, shared our handles in our, our chats and um, I hope that y'all have had fun. I had fun. Yeah. I thought this was lovely. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Uh, and I also thought the questions were so thoughtful. Oh my goodness. We were just yes, kind of really like, yeah, it. talk about silly things. So yes, thank you for coming through on that. Yes, um, and thank you again to the Vortex and Melissa. Um, and I hope everyone has um, a restful night. Um, if you have weird dreams, send them to Carol, I guess. Yes. Um, <laughs> If you, um, if you donate to a mutual aid fund, you are also entitled to send your birth time to me um, for an astrological chart reading. So Carol is a yes. fabulous astrologer, um, has been doing all of our birth charts just on the fly. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, or rather our readings based on our birth charts. Um, so yes, please um, do what you can or take a nap if you can't, because that's important too. Um, and have a beautiful weekend. Bye and thank you. Bye.